Hi, everybody. It's Dawn Fisher again, Morning Glory Needleworks. Welcome to Floss Tube number nine. I'm so excited. Um, again, I want to thank everybody who subscribed, commented, liked my channel, liked my videos. Um, I'm so excited to say my channel is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, I have almost 100 subscribers, which was my first goal. Uh, after that, we'll see. I'd like to get like thousands, but we'll see what happens. But um, anyway, I'm up to almost 100. So just keep subscribing, tell your friends. And as always, um, as in all my other videos, I've created what are called um, chapters. So if the video is long and you only want to see part of it, if you go down into the description at the bottom, I know on mine, my laptop, when I click on, I click on the link that says show more, underneath there's like a description. It'll say, welcome to floss tube number nine. And if you click on show more, it'll show the rest of what I had to say in that. It will have all the links to everything I talk about, my Etsy shop, my Instagram page. MG Needleworks is my Instagram page. So if you wanna follow me there, um, just any links to things that I talk about are also going to be in there. But what I've done is I've created chapters. So if you just want to see the part about where I talk about my antique sampler, there'll be a timestamp next to that. It could be 42 minutes and 37 seconds. So if you click on that, it will take you right to that area. So I've broken it down into however many chapters are in each um, each floss tube video. So that can save you some time. I hope you'll watch the whole thing. But if there's something you're in a hurry, you just want to see part of it, or this month we air it's uh, the first, so we have Stitch of the Month. So if you want to just go to Stitch of the Month, you can click on it and it will take you right there. So that's all my housekeeping out of the way. It's the first of May. I have so much to talk about. I'm really, really excited. There's a lot going on. So we're going to get started. First, of course, is my life update. Um, there isn't much, but uh, I learned something I did not know. Um, the battery to my car is in the trunk. Who would have thought? I had no idea. I guess they started doing that. And it really makes sense. So um, the battery died in my car. Luckily, it died right in front of our house. So I didn't have to uh, have it towed anywhere. So I waited a little while, but um, I finally went and bought a battery, went to Walmart and bought a battery. And something I found out that I did not realize, batteries are really, really, really heavy. So I found that out. So it was hard for me to carry it. Of course, Jeffrey, um, with his leg situation, can't really carry stuff right now, at least not that heavy. So I went and got a battery and then we went, um, Jeffrey came out and we unhooked the other battery. It's really nice. Actually, I, I like it, the battery being in the trunk because it was clean. I don't know if you've ever touched a car battery, but they're pretty nasty if they're in your engine, they're filthy. So um, being in the trunk, it was perfectly clean. Um, I just, luckily I didn't have much in the trunk. So I could just, there's a little, like a latch in there, you open it up. There's your little donut spare and um, there's the battery off to the side. So um, we got it all unhooked and everything. And he tried to loosen some of the nuts and realized we did not have the correct, whatever it is he needed. Ratchet um, with a 10 millimeter would take a 10 millimeter nut off. So um, we've moved some stuff around. He didn't know where he put his tools. So anyway. I ran to Walmart, bought some more tools, a couple of trips to Walmart, and we actually got it changed all by herself. So that made me feel good. I didn't have to have the car towed. I did call my insurance company, and yes, they have roadside assistance, and they will change a battery, but they only cover part of the cost. And I, I'd already spent a lot of money on a battery. My car, I have a Dodge Charger, and it takes a really big battery, so the battery was pretty expensive. Um, so anyway, but we did it ourselves. I'm so proud of us. So that was my excitement. But now, thank goodness, I have my car back. I was driving Jeffrey's van because it took me a while to get around to, to getting the battery. Actually, I was afraid there was something else wrong with the car. 
And um, I mean, I've had the car for six years, but I only have 41,000 miles on it. So that's the first time I've actually ch had the battery changed in the car. So I think that's pretty good because I've had them before and they only last about three years. So anyway, but my beautiful car, I can drive it again. I love my car. And um, so that was that excitement. I feel much better about that. We did, it was quite a big accomplishment. So another exciting thing I have to talk about is uh, Brick City. It's a cross-stitch shop in Ocala, Florida, which is a couple hours north of St. Petersburg, where I live. If you haven't been there, or if you come to Florida, you need to go there. It's a fabulous shop. She has tons of fabric, all sorts of goodies. She has a table where people come and stitch. Uh, I don't know what days because it's two hours away. So I don't go um, unless I'm in the area. But um, she they have a Facebook group called the Brick City Stitchers, which I'm a member of. And they are hosting a one-day retreat it's just a short retreat, just a few hours, and it's called Stitching with the Flossies on May 7th. So I'm really excited about that. She's invited some other um, floss tube, um, floss tubers, flossies, whatever you want to call them. Um, I don't think she knew I had a floss tube, and mine's not that big yet, so that's okay. Uh, but I'm going to get to meet some other people that have um, big floss tubes that a lot of people follow. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I'm gonna go to that and I'm gonna bring um, my Sari Outfill sampler, which I'll show you later the update on that. But the um, floss tubers, some of them that are gonna be there is uh, finally a farm girl and her name is Chrissy Morgan. Neely's Needle Nest, that's Melissa Neely. Stacy Stitches, that's Stacy Clock. Perpetual Projects, that's Aaron Vader. And Carolyn Stitches, who is uh, Carolyn Rhodes Miller. Um, I've not met any of these people before, so I'm really excited um, to visit and talk to them about their experiences and meet some other people and hopefully tell them about my Floss Tube channel, plus have a day away just stitching, other than it's a two hour drive up and I get to stitch all day and then a two hour drive back. So I'm really excited about that anytime. Um, I can get away just for a day to stitch. Um, that's always good. So also our, um, the group, it's called uh, the Library Stitchers. Um, we met in person for the first time in two years since all this started. Um, it was so good to see everybody. There was a really nice crowd. We meet at a local library. A lot of us have been meeting, I don't even know how long, um, since the late 90s, um, we've kind of known each other from uh, Lasting Impressions, which was a cross-stitch needlework uh, framing shop. It was in Palm Harbor, Florida. It's closed many, many, many years ago. But a group of us used to meet there every Thursday. And then once that closed down, we uh, there was a sampler group that met that I was a part of. And then that turned into just a group of stitchers and um, Cheryl Anderson's kind of been in charge of the whole thing. We love her because she's kept us kept us together. Uh, she uh, keeps us um, in line, keeps having finding us somewhere to stitch together. We used to stitch. She used to work for a lawyer, and they had a boardroom, and we would come in on like Saturday and stitch there all day, and just different places. And right now we're stitching at. Um, uh, the uh, library in uh, uh, it's about 20 some miles north of St. Petersburg so we meet there once a month and stitch and it was just so wonderful to see everybody again not everybody not everybody could make it there's quite a big group of us but there was quite a few I was surprised I think there was eight or nine of us so it was nice some people were in and out but just the fact that we could get together and see each other um, was um, was so nice so I hope you're getting out to get to stitch with some people again. It's, um, it just, it makes everything a lot easier if you can meet. Now we did meet over Zoom. Cheryl arranged that. She got a, a license to, um, so we could meet once a month over Zoom. So that was fun too. We would sit at home and everybody would just chat and 
it, it goes from like 10 o'clock in the morning till four in the afternoon. That's when the library was open. So you could come and go as you wanted. Uh, we'd stop and eat lunch and um, I'd be sitting there and all my cats would come in. They knew I talked about my cats all the time, but then they come in and they would crawl all over me. So everybody got to see the cats, all five of them. Well, maybe not all five, but anyway, they got to see a bunch of them, but it was just, uh, it's really nice. And I'm looking forward to um, next month, seeing them next month. So more exciting news. Um, now last, uh, last video, let me grab this here. Last uh, floss tube, floss tube number eight, I talked about my button box class. And um, this is a, a one day class that I teach. And, and this is on a Whitman's chocolate box that covers it very easy to complete. Um, but uh, so I was contacted by Sally Criswell of uh, Swanee Stitchers EGA, which is Embroiderers Guild. Um, it's a chapter, um, it's in the Sun region of the Embroiderers Guild of America. It's, it's about three hours north of here is where they meet. But they have asked me to come teach this class. I'm thrilled. I love teaching this. It's so much fun. I've taught it over Zoom a couple of times, but it's, it's really much more fun in person because I give you all these vintage buttons in the kit. But if we, if we meet in person, people bring their own buttons and share. And I usually bring a big bowl of buttons and people can dig through and, and find what they want. And it's, it's a lot of fun just to see how people work the design um, with their buttons, how it looks. So anyway, but I'm excited to say, again, I'm gonna be teaching this. It does have some pre-work before the class. You have to stitch these vines before you can come. So you have somewhere to put the buttons. And uh, it's a one day class, but because they have um, limited seating where they're holding the class, it's gonna be in Trenton, Florida. At, um, it's actually the building where uh, Sally Criswell used to have her, um, her own cross stitch slash antique store. And so it's in there and it has very limited seating. So I'm actually going to be teaching it two days in a row, but this again, seating is very limited. So if you're interested, um, I'm, I put a link down in the, in the uh, description again to the uh, Swanee Stitchers EGA Facebook page. And if you go on there, you will see registration does not open until um, May 15th. So it'll be the day my next video, but registration opens May 15th. I know there's been a lot of interest in it. I've posted it on all my Facebook and Instagram pages. And plus, of course, they have, and I've seen a lot of comments and things. So the class is going to be, uh, the first class is going to be Friday, September 23rd. And the second class is Saturday, September 24th. So you have to choose which day you want to come to the class. And it'll be from nine to four. And the cost is amazing. Um, they are only charging $130 for the class. That includes your kit, uh, my teaching, and uh, lunch. So that's, that's great for a one-day class. That's, that's very, very reasonable. So again, the class will be in Trenton, Florida. So if you're anywhere in the area, be sure to check it out. Again, I put a link in there. Um, so... Um, if you're interested, I hope you can come. Again, registration opens May 15th. Seating is very limited. So be sure to um, contact and get the information as soon as possible on that. Next, um, if you saw floss tube number eight, which was uh, the one on the 15th of April, I talked about some toy sewing machines, vintage toy sewing machines that I have in my collection. And um, that got a lot of response. People loved them. They thought they were great. So I wanted to talk about another sewing machine. This one's really unusual. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to give you a lot of information on it that I found on a website. It was actually the same one I found information on the um, Toy Singer sewing machine I showed in the, in the last video. So I put a link again on the bottom if you want to look up and see, uh, read this information or uh, keep it for yourself. But um, this is an actual sewing machine. Um, it's, it's called the Bell Portable Sewing Machine. So I want to let me pull this up and I have to take it apart and show you, but I found this in an, a local antique store here quite a few years ago. I've had it for a while, but I actually found it again the other day. You know how that goes when I was going through some stuff and I went, oh my God, I need to get this out. I've not tried to use it yet, but one of these days I'm going to try and use it. This is the case. Is this not, you would not think a sewing machine was in here. Let me open this up. This The case is actually very heavy because it's wood and it's covered in um, a uh, leather-like material is how they put it. And let me open this up. It pops open just like a regular, uh, like a briefcase. Oops, the lid comes off. So here is kind of coming apart. This is a sewing machine. It's very light. You can see that I can hold it with one hand. I don't know what it weighs, but it's not more than a few pounds. And um, this is not a toy. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Again, I'm gonna show you some more stuff. And if you go to the website that I'm gonna talk about, you'll be able to see some more um, information on it. But this was made by Bell. This is the Bell Portable Sewing Machine. Um, and I'm just, I'm going to read you what they have on their website. The, this is the research I get on it. And they called it the Bell Micro Portable Electric Sewing Machine, um, the Model MB. And it was also sometimes referred to as Model 102. And they called it the most beautiful and stylish miniature sewing machine made. And they say that these are... Um, Examples that are in good condition, like mine, they're highly prized by collectors. I love it. I, like I said, I had it for so many years, I actually forgot I had it. I remember, but, you know, I forgot how cool it was. So they were produced in either um, beige or green. This one's obviously the green. And they were manufactured during the 1950s. And early, the early machines have the name uh, Bell Manufacturing Corp of East this doesn't say it, of um, East South Street, Freeland, Pennsylvania. That's where uh, this one was made. And um, it was associated with I.J. Morick Corporation. But by 1953, uh, the name had changed to Bell Portable Sewing Machine Corporation, which that is what mine says. And sometime after that, it moved, the company moved to New, Jer New Jersey and later models were labeled made by I.J. Moritz of New York. So this machine was actually made in 1953. Okay, I found everything I needed, um, everything I wanted to show you. This is the little tag that was on the machine itself. It says the Bell Portable, and then it says see instructions on other side before operating. It actually, it tells you there's better instructions in the big book, but you could keep this with it. And it says this machine has been factory tested for best results. And on the back here, down in the bottom, it's hard to see because it's written in pencil, but it said it was inspected on November 16th, 1953 has a serial number 13577, which is on the back or on the back of the machine here. It says, it's hard to see, but there's little numbers right there that says um, the serial number on it. And the inspector was JC. So that would have been attached to the machine. And then there's this booklet, which is directions. And this is for all the attachments. There's a bunch of attachments in here. It has a narrow hammer. Now this just does straight stitch. So here you can see, here's your stitch width. And it has reverse and forward. Those are your choices. Looks like the switch might be gone from here. 
I have not tried to use this yet. So that's something I would like to try and use, but I'm a little leery about it. Um, you see, it doesn't have the big flywheel on the side that most of the machines had. It's um, inside the machine, but it's, um, yeah, it's got a different kind of switch to make the presser foot go up and down. So I just think it's very, very interesting. But um, I will go over, um, show you a lot of the items that are inside here. So there's a ruffler with it. There's a tucker, three-tone or a multiple slotted binder. And um, oh, there's a scissors cutting gauge. That might be handy to have. See that? It hooks, oops, hooks to your scissors. I have not pulled it out, so I will be pulling some of these um, things out. Oh, there's a quilting foot. So if you want to do um, quilting, there's a quilting foot that comes with it. So this book here is the actual um, instruction manual. And here it says on the back, uh, the Bell Portable is an all-American product manufactured at Bell Manufacturing Corporation's own plant in Freeland, Pennsylvania. When you own a Bell, service and parts as well as instructions are available from your local dealer or distributor. In addition, your Bell Portable carries lifetime guarantees by its manufacturer. Maybe I could find a manufacturer and get any pieces I need for this. Um, and it says the Bell Portable is the only machine of its kind unsurpassed in performance and unmatched in dollar per dollar value. So um, speaking of uh, dollar for dollar value, these were not inexpensive machines. So in 1954, this machine, which was about when this one was purchased, they were being sold for $79.95. Now in today's standards, that's like nothing. Well, not nothing, but that's inexpensive, but if you calculate it out, I actually went and used a, a calculator to uh, figure that out in 2022 dollars. This machine would have cost $855. So this was not cheap. This is a, a real sewing machine. This is not a toy. It's um, it's not real heavy, but it's, it's metal. It's very sturdy. Um, it's not plastic, it's not tin, it's very heavy. The plate is actually uh, off the bottom. I have the plate in the box here. But what you could do, now if you go to the website, they show how, to, how the machine sets up and you actually, there's a plate in the bottom. The um, box, come, the uh, carrying case comes apart and there's a plate here that you would set inside here and the machine sets inside of it. So this sits on your tabletop and this is how you sew. And then there's a, um, right, I'm gonna drop this here off my little stand. Here's the foot pedal. You see very old um, plug, plugs in, it's got a little three prong plug. And this says um, bell. Corporation, I believe. And oh, it's hard to see. Anyway, it says Bell Corporation on it. And there's a little thing here that says wind. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe, maybe there's a special switch you flip for winding bobbins. It's a little, uh, it's hard to see. It's there. You can see it down at the bottom. It says wind. So it looks to me like something went in there. So when you uh, hit the pedal, you know how when you uh, wind a bobbin, uh, the needle doesn't go up and down. So maybe that stops the needle. So, and all this fits right in this little case. So, and this also, this little box fits right in here and that actually fits when you put it in the bottom of the box to, um, or the bottom of the case to hold your machine in place. And this has, um, if you did not wanna put it in the case, you could also clamp this to a table. So that made the machine more of an open arm machine. So there's a little clamp in here. There's also some, um, oh, a key. Oh, that must be the key. 
um, to the uh, to the box. I just found this in here, so I might be able to lock this. There's a little key. I'll have to try that later. And this actually, there's a um, a little keychain on here, and it says "Property of Sally Schneider." And this has um, praying hands on the thing, but there's a, see, here's the screw. So you could clamp it to the table. It's a nice little box that all these um, accessories fit in. So talk about a nice travel table. I go to a lot of, I used to go to a lot of quilting retreats, even though I don't really quilt, I, I would sew some. And of course I would take my my little um, black featherweight, but someday I'd like to take this and pull it out and kind of have everybody freak out on it. So this is the top half, which is full of cat hair and that kind of stuff. Um, this is where the machine sits in here on its side when it is traveling. It fits in like that. And this is where um, the box of accessories goes. That little box I just showed you, that's where that goes. But on this side here, there's another wonderful box and it says um, attachments on it. So you slide that open and here's all these um, attachments. So here's, uh, it takes little tiny bobbins. You see those? They're little tiny plastic bobbins. It takes 15 X1 um, sewing machine needles. There's, um, I don't know what all this stuff does, but there's all sorts of attachments in here. Um, obviously somebody used it quite a bit because it looks like all these attachments have been used at one time or another different they're in wonderful shape um unfortunately it doesn't zigzag but um this looks like a ruffler and this um i believe is the quilting foot it's not a walking foot obviously but it's a a quilting foot but um i just thought this was the coolest sewing machine ever and it the box itself is heavy, but the sewing machine is very light. So it would kind of make a fun, um, fun travel machine. Again, I have to try it out. So uh, again, a little bit about it. Uh, the machine is nine inches long, seven inches high and three inches wide. So you can see it's very small and it's a uh, fully functioning sewing machine. It was never meant to be a toy, but a proper sewing machine for occasional household use. And again, it uses uh, 15 by one needles in small plastic bottle bobbins. And it says the bobbins are the same size used in the Singer 29-4. And we talked about all the tools as a full range of tools, special attachment feet. Um, and uh, we talked about the, I talked about the table clamp and um, that you could attach it. Um, you didn't have to put it in the uh, base of the box. You could put it, uh, um, attach it right to the table. So, and it says it was supplied with a base with a clip on cover or the leatherette covered box, which is what I have here. But I also have the um, clip on cover and it says the case is 14 inches wide, 10 inches high and four inches thick. Technically, you could put that in a suitcase. Of course, if they ran x-ray or what, they wouldn't know what it was and would probably try and um, open your suitcase to look and see what you have in there. But how great if you're traveling somewhere and you don't want to carry it on, you could just put it in your suitcase. It, it's not light, but um, if you have up to 50 pounds and don't take a lot of clothes or other sewing stuff, you could easily bring it with you. So... Um, Anyway, uh, I went over everything that was with it, but that's my fun vintage um, sewing item for this for this video. So again, now I have to put all that back together again and make sure I can close the box. But again, if there's anything you'd like to hear about um, next week or next um, video, I'll get away from um, from sewing machines and get back into um, 
needlework, accessories, I don't know what, pin cushions, uh, sewing birds, something along that line. So that's my cool item for this floss tube video. Next. Next is Stitch of the Month. Um, I want to, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I've been giving everybody all these stitches. Um, if you haven't signed up for the Stitch of the Month group, please do. I don't even know how many members we have right now. Quite a few. Um, but each month I provide, um, I go over a stitch here in the floss tube on the first of the month. And then I provide a flyer with the stitch recover for the month. And I was thinking, what, what's everybody going to do with all of these stitches? Are they going to know how to use them or where to use them in, um, in your needlework? So what I came up with was a stitch of the month sampler. So each month, I'm going to add a band. Now this starts, this top section here is... Um, for January, we're going to have a new band each month. I don't know how long it's going to be yet. I do know how wide it is. It's 25 stitches wide. So, um, so I'm going to have this on the Stitch of the Month Facebook group as a PDF you can download along with this month's stitch. So if you want to work the little Stitch of the Month sampler, start, make sure you leave it get along and because it's only 25 stitches wide, you could use a nice scrap of linen or even weave that you have. I haven't tried it on banding. I haven't stitched it yet because I actually just kind of came up with it. So um, maybe next month I can get some of this stitch so you can see how it looks. There may be some banding that's about 25 stitches wide. You can use whatever linen even weave. This really wouldn't work very well on Ada or uh, a count like that, you really need um, something with multiple threads where you're stitching over more than one thread at a time. Well, uh, like I said, a linen or an even weave. Now I've given colors here. You can use whatever colors you want. Um, I used two shades of like a red pink, two shades of blue, two shades of green and a yellow use whatever colors you want. Although I, I do give them here, I give DMC numbers. So whatever, whatever you want, um, it would be pretty stitched all in one color also. So again, now in January, what I talked about was basic cross stitching on linen, such as stitching over two threads and stitching over one thread. So this area here, stitch of the month 2022, will be stitched over one thread. So that's for January. These two stitches here are pinwheel roads. We did road stitch um, in February. I gave a variation a sheet with a bunch of uh, variety of road stitches. And one of those was um, pinwheel. And again, all these stitches are still available on the Stitch of the Month floss tube or Stitch of the Month Facebook page. So if you haven't already, be sure to sign up for that so you can get your, um, your flyers. This band here, it's hard to see, but there are yellow eyelet stitches here. So this is for um, March where we did Algerian eyelet. This row here is for April. I did satin stitches. I showed how to do satin stitches. This band here is um, queen stitch. <laughs> I know some people don't like queen stitch, but this is just a nice little amount. There's um, four a group of four queen stitches on each side. I'm going to go over that in a minute. But and then next month will be another band that will fit and go with this group and will fit right below this. So I don't know what that stitch is going to be. So if there's a stitch you want to learn, let me know or you think would look good with the sampler, let me know. And um, I may use that. I've already used um, someone wanted satin stitch and someone wanted road stitch variations. So I went over all of those. So, and each band is going to be four threads apart. So that is something I came up with. Again, this will be on the uh, Stitch of the Month uh, Facebook group. So now what we're going to do, this is the flyer for Queen Stitch for this month. And I'm going to demonstrate this in a minute. So here's your little band and this is how they're going to look from now on you're going to have a band that will fit 
the same one. This, see on the bottom there, it's the exact same pattern. So you'll get this band, which will fit four threads below the month before. And then um, I'll give the, uh, I'm gonna use the same um, symbols through the whole sampler. And then this is how to do the queen stitch. And again, I'm gonna go over that in just a minute. Here are instructions, just like always, on how to do that. So this is the uh, queen stitch, which is for May of 2022. So I'm gonna go over that and um, I'll discuss it. I do the PowerPoint for if you haven't seen me do the other ones, I use PowerPoint to teach. And then I also have a camera um, where you could see me demonstrating the stitches live. I've found that really helps so people can see, not just pointing and going do this and this and this, but actually showing how the stitch works. And um, that's how I teach. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, now I'll show the uh, little bit of PowerPoint and then demonstrate the stitch. So here's a much larger version of the uh, diagram uh, that I set up for the queen stitch. The queen stitch, I love it. I know a lot of people hate it or don't like it. Maybe they don't understand how to do it. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Um, I like it. So um, it's, it's not, it looks more complicated than it is, I think. What you're gonna do is it's uh, composed of four long stitches. You can see on the, the uh, diagram on the bottom left, it shows uh, the first part of the diagram shows the left side of the stitch. And then the other side, the one on the right side of the bottom left diagram shows with the right side completed. I did that because it gets to be too many numbers, but you can see all these stitches share holes. And if you look at the big diagram on the right, you can see that in that center, all these stitches share holes. These four, this is comprised of four queen stitches and they all share holes. So that center hole is going to have a lot of uh, stitches going down into it. So it's gonna get very crowded. Now, um, I've seen on antique samplers, some people use this as a pulled stitch. You can actually pull the longer stitches and it will open up that top and bottom hole, kind of like an eyelet, and you will have open areas. Um, you don't have to do that for this. If you want to experiment with it, go ahead. But again, always be consistent. If you're going to pull, them, pull the stitch tight, you need to pull all the stitches tight. Um, for your first time, if this is your first time doing it, I would not recommend pulling it tight. So uh, again, this stitch is made up of four long stitches. Each stitch is four long stitches that go into the same bottom hole and top hole. And then it has little um, tacking stitches going off to the sides, which move the sides open, make them curved. It'll be a little more curved looking. These look pretty straight, but it'll actually be kind of curved. So for step one, you come up in the hole and then you count up four threads. These queen stitches are done over four threads. You can do them over six, eight, varying numbers of threads, but they'll have a lot more legs. But this one's over four threads high and it's gonna be four threads wide. So you count up four threads and go down at two. Now, what you wanna do is leave your stitch a little loose. And I actually, uh, when I demonstrate, I'll show this. I pull it off to the side. And then from the center hole, you're gonna count up two threads, two fabric threads from where your first stitch was or two threads down from where you went down. It's the center hole. You're gonna count to the left one, one thread and come up. And that is step three, you're gonna, go over step two, the thread, the first um, thread that you stitched and pull it over to the side. You're gonna tack it down going over one thread. So that's the first stitch and just pull it tight it, or taut. Um, so then you're gonna come up in the same hole for step five as you did for step one, go down into the same hole as two for step six. Then you're gonna come up in the center hole 
for step seven and pull the a stitch over your long stitch, five, six step, pull it over one thread and take a tacking stitch over top of it to hold it down to the side. So you can see how it kind of curves the threads over. Now you're gonna do the same thing on the right side. You're gonna come up in the same hole as one and five and go down in the same hole as two and six. Only this time you're gonna go come up again in the center and then go over one stitch to the right, over one thread to the right and tack down step nine, 10. And again, you're gonna come up in the same hole, 13, 14 and go down in the same hole and then count over Actually, you're gonna come up where you went down for step 12 and tack the stitch off to the side. That is one queen stitch. Now, um, you can see when you go, you've done the bottom stitch here and I will show you how um, it works on the chart that you've got. This is actually the bottom center of your, and it's in between your cross stitch. So it's at the top center of your cross stitch and I'll show you in the live demonstration. So what you've done is the bottom center stitch here. Now, when you go up, when you go to do the other stitches, you can, uh, sometimes it's easier to work diagonally on these. So you could go up to the left or go up to the right. Um, I would suggest going up to the left because you've just gone down in this hole, the, um, in the bottom right hole. So for that last tacking stitch. So go up and work the stitch on the left, then work your top stitch, then work your um, stitch on the right. Again, I'm gonna demonstrate this, so don't get too confused. So, but if, and if you look at the chart, you will notice that the top set of queen stitches, we're gonna work the top set of queen stitches they are worked vertically. Now I have it diagrammed to work the two outer ones horizontally. So your top stitches will go this way, your other stitches will go horizontal. So you can just turn your diagram to uh, the other way. Or if you wanna do them all vertical, you can, it doesn't matter. Again, you just need to be consistent, but these can be worked horizontally or vertically. So that's, um, that's how you do the queen stitch. So now I will um, actually stop this, the PowerPoint, and then do a live demonstration for you. Okay, so um, as always, this is um, plastic canvas that I'm demonstrating with, and I'm using like a cotton, it's actually a cotton, uh, crochet cotton to demonstrate the stitches. So it's very big your stitches will be pretty tight. Um, and what I've done, this, these stitches here, let me pull this out, represent these four stitches here. So here you can see these stitches are vertical, these stitches are horizontal. That's what I was referring to. So what I've done, I've done these four stitches here, pull that tight, the four center stitches here. So what I'm gonna demonstrate is this stitch up here. So let me get started. Now, what I was saying, you can see on the diagram, let me pull this back out again. This shows this stitch right in the center of this X. So I'm going to start right in the center between the two legs of this cross stitch. That's where my first stitch is going to be. Now I'm going to demonstrate how to do the queen stitches. So you're gonna come up again, this is centered between the two legs of the cross stitch. I'm going to count up four threads and go down, holding my thread off to the left. Now I'm gonna count up two threads, go into the middle hole, and then count over one thread and then pull it tight and then take a tacking stitch. That holds your thread off to the left-hand side. I'm gonna come up in the same hole as one, 
go down in the same hole as two. Again, holding the thread off to the left. I'm gonna come up in the center hole, then pull my thread tight and go down over one thread. There's the first half of the queen stitch. Now I'm gonna come up same hole, go down in the same hole. And this time I'm gonna come up in that same center hole, pull this off to the right, hold the thread tight, go down over one thread to hold the stitch down or hold the, um, the stitch down to tack it down. So again, I'm gonna come up, go down in the same hole. I'm gonna go into this hole here, which shares with this tacking stitch. And there is the first queen stitch. Yours will be much tighter than that, um, depending on the, the count of fabric you're using and the thickness of your thread or your floss. Um, you may want to use one strand. Um, if it's very small, very tight, um, uh, a, a high count of fabric, you may want to use one strand because this gets very thick. This doesn't show it because this is 10 count plastic canvas, but it can get very tight. So you may wanna experiment. Usually two threads gives um, good coverage. So now, again, before I do my next stitch, it's gonna share holes with these two stitches on the side. I can't come up in this hole on the right because that's where I went down. So I'm going to do my next stitch over here on the left side. And I'm going to count up four threads and work it just like I did the other one. Come up in the center, go over one. And then just continue working the stitch. Here's the left side. Now I'm going to work the right side. And once you get the rhythm, um, I just enjoy these stitches. I like the way they look. They make really good strawberries and um, pineapples just because of the texture of them. So there's two. So the next one, I could move over here and do this one because I just went down into this hole. So I can either come over here and work this stitch over here, or I could come up here, four threads above, and work my way down. You don't have to, um, once you start a stitch going in the top or the bottom of it, you need to continue. So my next, all my stitches are gonna go down into this uh, or come up in the same hole. So I'm always going to come up in the top. And you can see where this center hole is going to be very full. And it's much easier to come up into a hole that doesn't have quite as many stitches in it. If you had to come up in this hole with all these stitches, it would be pretty tight. And with this thick thread, even with these big holes, it's getting pretty full. Where you, so you could see where using one strand may be easier depending on the count of your fabric. So now, um, so you would work your next stitch here. You would come up in this hole and do your next stitch. But what I wanna do is show you how to do the horizontal. It's worked the same as a vertical. You just do it on its side. So you would take your, um, here's the diagram. You would just, instead of holding your diagram this way, you would hold it um, this way to do your stitches. So I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna go horizontally across four threads, keep my stitch out loose, come up two threads or one thread over. And no, yeah, one thread over and tack that stitch down, then go, up in the same hole.
and tack the stitch down. So you're going to do the same thing. You're going to come up. Your first step is going to be in between the legs of this cross stitch. So it will be offset. And then you'll continue just like you did with the other one. And I would come over here and work this stitch. Four threads up and go down. Count over one thread and tack it down and just continue. Now, um, some people like to do the inner two stitches first and then the outer two. It's up to you. Uh, this is how I do it. You can work it whatever way is most comfortable for you. But you can see how, um, how this is going to work. Of course, now I'm running out of thread. But there you have it. There's your uh, vertical queen stitches and your horizontal queen stitches. So try that out. And I hope you enjoy. Like I said, this is one of my favorite stitches. It took me a while, but once I once I really started using it, um, I just love it. I hope you enjoyed um, Queen Stitch, Stitch of the Month, and I hope you'll uh, work the sampler. And as you work it, uh, post pictures in the Stitch of the Month. I just, I love it when people uh, show me what they're working on. We need more people to show what stitches they're doing and what they're working on. I'd really like to get more involvement. So I need to do more too. I try and post pictures as often as I can. But, and as one of the latest things I've been posting, and I talked about this, if you look on there, I actually finished section four of Sari Outfield, which I've been working on for a while. Again, this sampler was stitched in 1709 by Sari Outfield. I don't have any other information on her. Um, this is a uh, 46 count linen. It, which is the same count as the linen she stitched her sampler on. I'm reproducing this. Eventually this pattern will either be for sale or I'm actually thinking about doing some kind of a class with it. Um, it does have like 10 shades of silk and it's stitched with silk thread. So, but I am loving it. The satin stitch turned out beautiful. Um, let me pull my light around. I don't know if that'll help. So you can see this better. But I've started section five. You see the little, this section is double running. And these are little, what they call boxers. Um, they're little men. And they, um, I'm just gonna try and find, here's the, no, you can't see the diagram much better, but there's the diagram of the little boxer guys. They're hard to see because they're done in pink. Um, and I have them charted in color. I know, let me pull this up on um, the camera that I use and then um, you can see it better. That'll be easier. Okay, that's much better. You can see the little guy. This is the little, what they call boxers. And there's going to be a big uh, flower plant here uh, that he is presenting his flowers to. Someday I'll give a, a little talk about um, boxers. Here's the flower that's going to go in the center and then there'll be another boxer on the other side. And if you've heard me talk about this before, this sampler is very unusual. Well, it isn't really. Parts of it are stitched over three threads, parts are stitched over four. There's a couple little things stitched over two. This section's, um, this area is all worked over four threads. So it actually works up pretty quickly. It's done in, um, double running, which could be reversible, um, except there's some parts because of the way it is, it can't be. Um, there's little yellow stitches here. He has these little stripes on his legs and little yellow stitches. What's strange is this flower here on the left side, this bottom, the base is stitched over four threads and then from the leaves up is stitched over three. So, that was a little confusing to set up. Um, it took me a while to figure it all out. But anyway, I, I worked all this in a couple of evenings. I only stitch maybe a couple, an hour or two every night. But, um, and I was working away diligently on this. And when I got up here, I realized 
I'm too far over. I should be way over. So um, I found, figured out way down here, I am one stitch off. So right now, series and time out because all this has to come out. I was kind of disgusted. Uh, that took a couple of hours of my time. So it all has to be pulled out. So I put Sari in time out. So, um, cause I'm mad at her. So, although it's my fault, but see, we all make mistakes. If you think you're upset cause you make a mistake. Well, we all make mistakes, let me tell you. And um, that's not one I can fudge. Sometimes you can fudge your mistakes, but that one, that one needs to come out because it won't fit. And then it would be off for the side. So anyway, that is um, Sari, that's where I'm at. Hopefully I can pick her back up again tonight. I have to edit this video, so we'll see um, if I have time to stitch tonight or not. But I'm still loving it, even though I'm a little disappointed about the, um, the error in counting. I should, should have been concentrating more on that instead of watching, um, what are we watching, um, Prime, video. I think we were watching Harry Bosch, which are great. If you watch, if you like crime shows, Bosch, I love it. We've, we've already been through all seven seasons, so we have to find something else to watch, but that's, that's what I love. So anyway, <laughs> and the final thing I want to talk about, um, I always talk about um, some of my antique needlework or um, a, something I've designed. So this time I'm going to talk about both. This is an antique sampler I purchased. I fell in love with it. It's in pretty poor shape, but I knew I could reproduce it. So I bought it anyway, even though it's, it's in kind of rough shape. I have her wrapped in um, acid-free tissue, but this is Mary Gilbert. It's a very tiny, tiny little sampler. Let me, um, I'm going to put it over on, I'm going to share the screen again and show, um, so I can show a close up of her. Okay, so I put her on the camera so you could see her a little better. Um, again, it's in really rough shape, but she used a pretty common alphabet so I could figure out what the A would look like here. And obviously she's got the same um, satin stitch border. Uh, let me I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. But it's, it's a beautiful little sampler. Um, it was stitched by Mary Gilbert in 1779. Again, another reason any samplers before the 1800s are rare and often in this bad of shape. You can see here, there's some damage. Somebody tried to darn it with some white thread here. She's been, um, she's had a rough life, but um, I'm taking care of her. Let me focus. And um, I've actually reproduced the sampler. Um, I do have the patterns I need, they'll be in my Etsy store. I'm hoping by the time uh, this video comes out, there's a link to the Etsy store in the, um, in, at the bottom in the description area again. And I'm going to show you the back. And you can see, see all this? She was glued to something, to a piece of paper. I don't know what, it was white, probably glued to a piece of paper, but you can see where they ran the glue along. So it's, it's very disappointing. Um, I'm gonna zoom in there. You can see a little bit better, all the glue on there. I have not tried to take it off. Like I said, it's very fragile. You can see there's some more mending up here, trying to hold it together. Um, also, I want you to note, see how bright the colors are here on the back? And then they're faded on the front. So what I've done, I've reproduced the sampler. I've reproduced the sampler. And I've given you two options. I used um, classic color work silk. Here is um, what the pattern is uh, looks like. What you'll get, here's um, the back of it. Here's your satin stitch directions, which we've gone over there. Here's all the colors. 
I stitched mine in classic color work silk or belsois, as it used to be known. And what I did is I gave two colors. I gave the bright color that's on the back. And then I also gave the muted color that's on the front. I also added, for those of you that don't use silk or don't want to spend the money for the silk, I get, these are DMC colors. And I gave the same thing, um, the muted color and the bright color. So here is, there is my reproduction. It's bigger. This The reproduction, I think, was stitched on um, 40 count. I mean, the sampler's tiny. It's 113 stitches high and 77 stitches wide. And this, the original was on 48 count cream linen. I may redo it on the, um, I do have some 46 count linen. And what I've stitched it on is 40 count cream Newcastle linen. And this is um, the, this is the uh, muted color here. This is the muted color. And then this one, is the bright color. So you can see the difference. And you can also see my mistake I made here. I went one too many or two too many of the little sawtooths. And of course I stitched to the bottom and then worked my way up, big mistake. So again, we all make mistakes. I'm not taking all of that bottom part out to fix it. But, <laughs> but there's, you can see the two different, how the two different colors look. Um, it was a lot of fun to stitch, and you can see where I um, worked out um, the A, the letters that were missing, the corners of the sawtooth border are all different on all the edges, um, and I worked out just from uh, <laughs> the corners, except for one of them, are actually all gone on the sampler, but I worked it out from the one corner that was left. Um, I did work how, how to um, how to do each of the corners, but it's a fun little stitch. So again, this is going to be available in my Etsy shop. And, um, this, this has worked over, her name has worked over one thread. The, um, her, the initial, her initials, the first letters are worked over two threads and then the name is, and year worked over one thread. So that'll give you practice on working over one thread. But again, this will be available um, in my Etsy shop, um, hopefully today or by the time this, this video comes out, I'm hoping I can get that in there. I do have some other things to do. So at least within the next couple of days, that will be available. Um, but I want to thank everybody again for, for watching my videos. Thank you for subscribing. We're getting real close to 100. I'm so excited. Maybe when we get to 100 subscribers, I can do something special um, If uh, for all the subscribers. Um, I'll announce it when it happens and then um, figure out how to, um, how to get names to draw prizes. I know other... Uh, Floss tubers do that also. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody to give you a chance to win something from me. So uh, be sure to comment. I love comments. Uh, if you enjoyed it, if there's something more, if I missed something, something else you want to learn, please let me know. Again, um, all the links are posted in the bottom. So uh, go visit, go learn. And I hope I see you at a class or a retreat someday. Be sure to um, let me know. Follow me on Instagram. If you're not on Facebook, I'm on both. I have a lot of Facebook accounts. Um, Morning Glory Needleworks has a Facebook account. Um, there's the Stitch of the Month, which I hope you'll join. It's like a free class every month. And then I have my own. Uh, actually, I have two uh, uh, Facebook pages. Plus, we have one for our antique store also, which is Morning Glory Cottage. Um, so, uh, and then Instagram is MG Needleworks. So I hope you will follow me. And again, thank you so much. And I will see you on the 15th of May.